Well, thank you. Um, first of all, in common with the other speakers, let me express my uh, sympathy and support um, and the sympathy and support of the scientific community for the people of Japan in this difficult time. Now, it falls to me to just, in, at the end of this session, to, I think, try and broaden the perspective a little, widen the perspective a little. So let me just first define uh, how I'm going to broaden the perspective. I'm going to stick to the observable universe, which I think is a reasonable thing to do. Um, the observable universe is still quite large. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures of the observable universe. That's actually a picture of a piece of sky. You might have recognized the Orion, the constellation of Orion there. But this picture that I want to show you, it's called the Hubble Deep Field image, is a picture of a piece of sky that you would cover if you took a five pence piece a small coin and held it about 75 feet away. Now the Hubble Space Telescope a few years ago now opened its camera to this tiny piece of sky for thousands and thousands and thousands of seconds and took a long exposure photograph. Um, and we're still zooming into that piece of sky now. It was a piece of sky that was pretty much completely black from the Earth. So there were virtually no stars in the Milky Way galaxy in that piece of sky. But um, when the Hubble Space uh, Telescope had taken that picture, uh, this is what turned out. This is the picture that it, that it displayed to us. Um, every point of light, pretty much, in that picture turns out to be a galaxy, uh, an island of, on average, 100 billion stars, like our sun. There are over 10,000 galaxies in that image. The most distant are over 13,000 million light years away, which means the light from them has traveled across the universe to reach us for pretty much the entire age of the universe, 13,000 million years. So the observable universe itself is big. If you extend that over the entire sky, we think there are something like 100 billion galaxies in it. And we now actually have evidence that that's only a small part of the universe. We think the universe could well be spatially infinite, which, as Woody Allen said, is unfortunate if you're one of those people who can't remember where they put things. We also <laughs> think that the universe <laughs> may be temporally infinite in that it may exist forever. Again, Woody Allen said that eternity is a very long time, especially towards the end. <laughs> uh, so that's the... Um, region of space I want to combine my comments to. What I really want to talk about is the, the value of science and engineering, and I hope touch on the value of the energy industry, because we must remember that all this knowledge, these, uh, these little scientific facts I'd like to share with you for the next 20 minutes or so, rest on the fact that we have a successful economy, a successful industrial civilization, and to me it's absolutely clear that that rests on the energy industry. I think one of the problems, I, I listen with great interest to the debate, the panel debate, one of the problems it seems to me is the, the in policy terms, is the acceptance of evidence, the, the emergence of evidence-based policy, certainly in the UK, but I think across the world. Because it seems to me that the uh, evidence, the, the persuasive nature of the case for gas is, is clear. It's, it's based on facts. And we, we have that problem in science also. I'd like to touch on that a little bit as the talk goes on. But I thought I might just um, show you uh, for 30 seconds, a little clip of one of, I think, the great scientists and the great science communicators of all time, Richard Feynman, explaining in a lecture many years ago now about the scientific method, because I think that the scientific method, the, the accumulation of evidence and the acting on that evidence is clearly key to the future of energy policy. So let me, let me show you Richard Feynman's little debate. How we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> then we com Well, don't laugh. That's not really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guessed is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature. Or we say compared to experiment or experience compare it directly with observations to see if it, if it works. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is, it doesn't make a difference how smart you are who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it.
Yeah, it seems uh, I, I enjoy that clip. It, it seems to me to summarize the, the, the point of science and engineering, the, the basis of its success. But I think it also does highlight a, a problem that, that we have um, in trying to convince policymakers and the public of the, the, the correctness of our position, which is it does sound rather brutal. Um, in terms of my science, the, the, I want to talk now about that a little bit, particle physics, the Large Hadron Collider. Um, at CERN in Geneva, it's worth asking the question, well, how do we gain evidence about this picture of the universe that we have? This is a, a picture of our universe as we see it at the moment. We think it began 13.7 billion years ago. In fact, um, I just love showing this for no other reason than it's an astonishing scientific achievement, I think. We've measured the age of the universe now as 13.73 plus or minus, not 0.12 billion years old. That, that is the currently accepted view with errors on it of the age of the universe. It's one of the greatest achievements. But how do we gather evidence about the beginning of the universe, in particular the first billionth of a second after the universe began? Well, we use this thing, which is by far, I think, and I don't think I'll insult anyone here, the, the, the most complicated cryogenic installation in the world, if not the biggest. It's certainly been the prototype, I think, for understanding many uh, advances in cryogenic technology. It's the Large Hadron Collider. It's 27 kilometers in circumference. It sits in a tunnel about 100 meters below Geneva. You can probably see Geneva Airport runway there at the top of the Large Hadron Collider to get some scale for this machine. Its job is to accelerate protons to 99.999999% the speed of light. That's the nuclei of hydrogen atoms. At that speed, they circumnavigate the ring 11,000 times a second. It's what scientists call ultra-relativistic in the sense that Einstein's theories apply when you're traveling that fast. So much so, in fact, that that 27 kilometer in circumference ring is seen by the protons to be only four meters in circumference. Now that presents interesting engineering challenges because you've got to build the machine taking account of the fact that as far as the protons are concerned, that's only four meters around and you've got to change the magnetic fields to contain those protons um, appropriately. This is the inside of the machine. Uh, I mentioned it was the world's most sophisticated cryogenic system. That's because this whole machine, all 27 kilometers of it, runs at 1.9 Kelvin, so about minus 270 Celsius. It, it is uh, a superconducting machine. It is cooled by superfluid liquid helium, which is astonishingly difficult to do. Um, those two pipes you see there um, are, in fact, the beam pipes. So those are the pipes in which these beams of hydrogen nuclei circumnavigate the machine. Um, when we cross them together to collide them to create these astonishingly violent conditions, then they're about the diameter of a human hair, and yet they carry the energy of an aircraft carrier traveling at 30 miles an hour. Now, I was told last night that's not appropriate because aircraft carriers don't travel at 30 miles per hour. They travel at about 26 knots. So I apologize to the shipping uh, fraternity for that mistake. But I think the, the engineering achievement on its own is quite astonishing here. And you can see, actually, in fact, if I know the next slide, these cables here which join the magnets together. Now, those magnets have a magnetic field for the engineers amongst you of eight tesla or so. That means those cables have to carry a current of upwards of 11,000 amps. Um, they're, of course, very small because they're superconducting cables. They operate well at 1.9 Kelvin, not very well at temperatures slightly above that. And actually, you may have known about two years ago, we did try the experiment of raising the temperature slightly of one of those cables by accident. Accident. Um, that was the outcome. Um, that's because the stored energy in the magnets in the machine, something like 11 gigajoules, um, which is a lot of energy to discharge very quickly. Um, we made a bit of a mess of the machine then, but we fixed it now and it's running absolutely beautifully. How do we... Uh, make sense of those conditions. So we collide hydrogen nuclei together. I should say we can collide 600 million nuclei together every second, 600 million protons per second. That's 600 million mini big bangs, if you like, every second. We've got to photograph those, and we photograph them with four detectors like this. This is the one that I work on. It's called the Atlas Detector. It's essentially a digital camera. You see there, the scale is astonishing. It's 44 meters wide, 22 meters in diameter. Seven 7,000 tons of digital camera. You can perhaps see two little uh, people stood at the bottom, a little green person, a purple person, just to get some sense of the scale of this thing. You also see those ladder-type structures, the gray ladders there. They're also superconducting magnets, also cooled by superfluid liquid helium. Um, 
This is the picture of one of those magnets um, being taken down into the Atlas cavern. Uh, the, the blue circle there is the Large Hadron Collider that sweeps out around underneath Geneva. Um, one of the great achievements, I think, of CERN is not only the physics that's coming out of it, which I'll talk about for a little while, a few minutes in a moment, but also just the engineering challenge of building this thing. Um, there are more components in the Atlas detector than there are in a Saturn V rocket, but they're primarily electronics, detectors, high-tech silicon detectors, detectors to detect every possible kind of particle you could make in those collisions. Here's another very famous picture during construction with those magnets in place and a, and a real person stood in the middle. The collisions happen right in the middle of that. And this is just one picture of a, a collision that happened actually just a few, uh, about a month or two ago now. Um, the machine is running absolutely beautifully, producing new results every moment. So what is it that the machine is designed to do? Well, it's essentially there to further our knowledge of the forces of nature. Now, we, I'll give you one example of one of the reasons we built it. So we've been stuck. We've had a problem in our theory, our basic theory of the forces of nature now for probably since arguably the 1960s. And it has its origin in our misunderstanding, our lack of understanding in the nature of mass in the universe. So literally the reason that particles like electrons, the building blocks of matter, quarks, the building blocks of us, have any mass at all, the reason they don't travel through the universe at the speed of light, has been a problem for us. And that's prevented us moving on with our theory of the forces of nature. So this is in many ways part of the, well in uh, the way I suppose, the, the part of the main line in the development of physics. You can go back to Newton with gravity, Maxwell with electromagnetism, the, the, the forces that control the nucleus in the 1930s, 20s, 30s, and 40s. We've been stuck because of the nature of mass. Now, you may have heard of the most popular theory to explain what the origin of mass is. It's called the Higgs theory. Um, and this is actually, this slide, although rather odd and opaque looking, is actually a very nice, um, example, uh, an explanation of what the Higgs mechanism is. And I'd like just for a minute or so to try and explain that to you. See, the picture is that the universe is full of a field called the Higgs field. It's almost like, um, it's almost like the old-fashioned ether in many ways. It permeates all of space. It's inside us, inside this room, out to the edge of the universe. And its job is to give mass to the particles that move through it. Now, there's a very famous story, which I believe is true, that back in the 1980s in the UK, when science funding was under threat from then the Margaret Thatcher's government, um, the government said to us, the science minister, William Waldgrave at the time, said, well, look, if you scientists can explain on one sheet of A4 in language even a politician can understand what the Higgs is, then we will give you the money to carry on at CERN and go and look for it. A competition was run, and this is the analogy that won. It works beautifully well. This is a British Conservative Party conference, and these are members of the British Conservative Party wandering around inside the conference. They represent the Higgs field, the Higgs particles, as it were. Now, if you imagine that somebody who isn't very popular and is not known walks into the room, then they can walk through the room, nobody talks to them, nobody interacts with them, and so they move through the room unimpeded. The analogy is that that's a particle like a photon, a particle of light. It's massless, it travels through the universe at the speed of light because it doesn't interact with the Higgs field. Then imagine someone very important, wise, and uh, walks into the room. I know that's slightly culturally specific, so I had an alternate version <laughs> for the other walks into the room, then everybody wants to talk to them. Everybody wants to interact with them. And so their passage through the room is slowed down. Now, that's how the Higgs mechanism works. It, quite literally, the particles that make up you and me and everything we can see in the universe get their mass in this theory from the interaction with the Higgs field. If that's true, then those little blue people there, the Higgs particles, will turn up at the LHC. We will discover them, we will see them, and we will confirm that theory. If it's not true, then whatever does the job of those little blue people, the Higgs particles, we know will turn up at LHC because we know exactly where to look for that mechanism. 